Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ray. I'm a detransition male, and today I want to talk about autogynephilia, repression, um, detransition, integration, basically how to deal with autogynephilia in a healthy way. Now, obviously, I'm only really capable of giving my own perspective on this topic, but has someone who transitioned, who tried to deal with my own autogynephilia via the pathway of transition and then ultimately detransitioned after eight years of hormone therapy, after eight years of social transition. Um, I wanted to kind of give my perspective because I basically tried every different strategy under the sun. You know, I've tried repression, I've tried integration, I've tried full-blown transition, I've tried hormones. Um, and, you know, I've given this a lot of thought in regards to what is the healthy way to deal with this, because there are some people in the gender critical world or in the conservative world who basically feel that the healthiest thing to do is to repress, to fully repress. So you have these desires, you want to feminize, there's a underlying erotic or, or romantic um, feeling uh, that has to do with that desire to feminize. And the question is, is it possible to fully repress that desire such that you never feminize, you never engage in that desire? And in my personal experience, <laughs> it is not possible to repress fully. And I tried this. When I first detransitioned, I really swung into the masculine dimension. I thought I'm just going to be a masculine man. Um, I started, um, you know, watching all this like red pill content, manosphere content in regards to how to develop a healthy sense of masculinity. Now, obviously, I came to terms with my male sex, my natal sex, my biological reality as a male. I came to terms with the idea that in virtue of being male, I'm always going to be a man. And I just learned to accept that. And I learned to not hate my male body because that was one of the big driving factors behind my medical transition was I sort of came to associate my male body with all these negative things because it interfered with my desire to feminize. Um, but was transition ultimately a healthy way to deal with that? Now, I don't want to sort of project and say that my experience, you know, is going to reflect everyone else's experience. But in my, ex in my personal experience, transition was not the ultimate solution. Taking on the trans identity, saying to myself, I'm a trans feminine person, I'm going to use she, her pronouns, I'm going to sort of try and integrate myself into the opposite sex gender role in society such that I'm using female spaces, I'm asking people to you know, use, you know, uh, female pronouns um, for me um, in my workplace, in my social life. I'm using a female name, um, you know, in, in my social ident identity. I do not think that was like ultimately the best way for me to deal with my autogynephilia because my autogynephilia was the impetus for my transition, for my social transition, for my medical transition, but ultimately, it was not necessarily healthy to sort of run away from my sex, to run away from my male body, to try. And, and I think ultimately that was born out of a inability to integrate my femininity into my image of myself as a man. Because when I first started dealing with all this gender stuff like nine years ago, my therapist basically, you know, I started talking about, you know, my cross-dressing and my interest in femininity. And she put this idea that I'm trans and that transition is the right solution. Taking on this whole elaborate social identity because I wanted to cross-dress, I wanted to be feminine and I wanted to be public about it because I didn't want to necessarily hide the fact that I was a fem that I was interested in femininity, that I wanted to cross-dress. But that cross-dressing was not necessarily something that I saw as compatible with a male identity. And there was this easy uh, social role, this social identity that I felt was the only pathway for me to express myself as a feminine male, which was the trans identity. Because the trans feminine identity, the identity of a trans woman, 
a trans feminine person, that social identity is uh, acceptable in our society, particularly in liberal progressive circles, which were the circles that I ran in at that time. Um, and so that trans identity was the only way, the only way I thought that I could successfully integrate my femininity into my self-concept. But over the years, <laughs> you know, that uh, social identity as a trans woman, which necessarily involved, I thought at the time, you know, trying to, you know, have people perceive me to, to, to be female, to use female spaces. I, you know, use like the female uh, bathroom. Um, and, you know, that, that ultimately caused more uh, harm than good. I, I don't think that was healthy for me to do because like, it, it just caused a level of self-consciousness. I, I became concerned about being something that I'm not. I, I became overly obsessive in regards to this idea that I need to pass. Um, I need to be more and more feminine. And the more I transitioned, the more I tried to be feminine, the worse my hatred of myself became. The more dysphoric I became the more self-conscious I became. And ultimately, this caused a sort of incongruity or split in my consciousness that led to neuroticism and self-consciousness such that, you know, I wasn't able to be myself. I was always on guard. There was this background anxiety in regards to passing of, you know, people finding out that, you know, I'm, I'm trans. And, you know, I think if I had had more role models or examples of males who have autogynophilia, who, um, you know, accept their male body, accept their male sex, and just are feminine, are just feminine males who don't take on a feminine social identity, who just, you know, use male spaces, use their male um, identity, you know, uh, you know, identify themselves as male, like I, 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 I'm a male, I'm a man, I just like feminine things. I'm just a feminine man. And if I had had role models for feminine men who have auto, autogynophilia, who are not in denial that that is the root cause of why they want to be feminine, I think I wouldn't have gone down that social path. And, you know, I would have learned to integrate my femininity into my concept of myself as a person. And I think that would have ultimately been more um, healthy because like, I wouldn't have been delusional in regards to who I am. I would have grounded myself in reality rather than trying to ground myself in this identity as like a trans feminine person. And even though I never really full blown like identified myself as a woman, I, you know, um, the thought of myself as like non-binary, trans feminine or whatever, I still think even that was running away from my male self. It caused my dysphoria to get worse. The more I transitioned, the more I hated things about myself, the more I tried to hide who I was. And it wasn't just safety or something like this, because I live in a liberal urban center where there's not really safety concerns. It was all in my head. It was all uh, self-consciousness of my own doing. And when I transitioned or when I detransitioned, you know, I basically realized that like, I need to accept my self. I need to accept who I am, accept my, my maleness, like learn to be a feminine man. Now, during my detransition process, I kind of, uh, you know, attempted to repress. I thought that I could repress my femininity, that I can just be this masculine guy, this macho guy, and that I could just repress these desires and just be, be, be this masculine guy. You know, I was like listening to like, you know, manosphere content and how to develop a positive sense of masculinity. It's like, oh, I need to be this masculine guy. And ultimately, I don't think that <laughs> was healthy either. Um, but I don't also think I need to do this like full time. I don't need to express myself in a feminine way all the time. Like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, go to work like this. I wouldn't necessarily, <laughs> you know, go to the grocery store like this because I like the idea of not having to put on this construction. This is all a artifice. This is all a construction. I have to shave my face, 
to put on makeup and it's not like my natural self like and you know it's too artificial it's too constructed and um and 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 that wasn't healthy at all because when i was living this identity as a trans woman you know i had to shave all the time just to like answer the door the door or run up to the grocery store or go out for a quick errand i have to like you know shave and you know put on all this work um to put on this these layers of artificiality in order to make my social image compatible with how I presented myself. And that wasn't healthy either. Whereas now, you know, identifying as a guy, being a male, like accepting myself as a man, I don't have to feel like I need to put on all this stuff. This essentially just becomes like playtime. It's fun. I like doing this. It's sort of like part of, you know, my my expression. And, you know, I, I can leave it in the bedroom if I want to. I can leave it in the house. I don't have to, you know, construct this identity all the time, which causes incongruence, which is ultimately inauthentic. I wasn't able to be myself. Because now I don't have this idea that, oh, I need to modify my voice. I need to change the way I express myself. I need to worry about hiding my Adam's apple. I need to try and pretend that I'm female. I need to, that I have to try and act like I'm something that I'm not. Whereas now I fully accepted my, uh, my maleness, I accepted that I'm a man and I just, you know, like to express myself in, in a feminine way sometimes. And I feel like this is much more healthy versus, you know, one trying to go the full blown transition pathway, which has, you know, one, there's, there were, you know, serious health consequences from being on estrogen. I had a pulmonary embolism. I had uh, elevated triglycerides that led to pancreatitis. Um, you know, that being on my natural, um, you know, hormonal uh, um, system is so much more healthier. And like, so I feel better. I have more vitality, more f physical vigor to be on my natural hormonal system. I think, it, and, and I'm not plugged into the medical system. I'm no longer a lifelong, lifelong medical patient. And I just don't think it's worth it to become a lifelong medical patient just so that you can express femininity. That's just not worth it. I think it is much better to learn to accept your male body, to accept your natural state. I think it is, all things considered, better to be natural, to not be dependent on the pharmaceutical industry, to not be dependent on, you know, getting blood tests all the time or going to the doctor all the time. You know, um, I, I think it's healthier to just accept yourself, to learn to love yourself as you are in, in your natural state of being. Because that is the healthy thing to do. That is the net. I think you know, all things considered, natural is better. <laughs> when, when, like, unless that you know, a natural state is going to cause your organic integrity as a physical being to you know crumble, then you should just you know, if, if you're physically healthy, just stay the way you are. Like, you don't need to you know, inject you know um, drugs into your system to become a pharmaceutical patient. Um, your whole entire life in order to just learn to be feminine, to express yourself, to, to be natural and authentic. So I'm much happier not being plugged into that medical industry. Um, and I just feel better in terms of like my energy, like, you know, my physical health. And I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't have as much like, you know, dysphoria in regards to the natural expression of my male body. Like, for example, I like to exercise. I like to lift weights. And when I was, you know, identifying as a trans woman, there was always this, you know, incongruity with like, you know, working out and being healthy, like being physically healthy was incongruous with like, you know, my social identity, because as a naturally male person, you know, the testosterone in, in my body, you know, led to more muscle gain. Um, and I always wanted to diminish that. I wanted to make myself smaller. I wanted to make myself weaker. I wanted to make myself physically less capable in order to live up to this socially constructed idea that I was trying to play out as, you know, as a feminine person, as, as a woman. Whereas now, 
I, I don't have to worry about that because I'm not trying to pass. And I think the whole that I think that's like the, the the most fundamentally unhealthy aspect of the trans identity is this obsession with passing of being something you're not. And you know the whole like non-binary thing that is itself like just a uh, distorted, confused way to just express yourself as a male. You don't need to buy into all this language and confusion in regards to, oh, I'm not male, I'm not female, I'm non-binary. Just no, you like, just, I think it's healthy to be a feminine male, to express yourself as a feminine male, to just realize that you can be a male or a female and you can be a masculine as feminine as you want and that doesn't make you not a man. That doesn't make you not a male. And just, you know, learn to accept yourself. And I think that's like healthy. And, and for me, that has been the healthy journey to realize that I can be a man, I can be a male, and I can just express myself. And I don't have to repress all this either. Because I think that is the other thing that is potentially, you know, uh, dangerous for detransitioners is to try and like swing the pendulum in the other way to think that, you know, to fight against your own desires to feminize. Um, you know, that just leads to rumination and obsession and neuroticism and that sort of like struggle to fight, um, you know, your own internal, you know, expression of your desires. And, you know, but you have to, you know, be sensible about this. You have to be healthy about it. And, you know, there's definitely like some AGPs out there who just, you know, go way too in the fetishistic component and they put it into the public world and they just sort of like are unable to control their sexual impulses. And that is unhealthy in and of itself. So to some extent, you know, there needs to be some moderation because ultimately all this has its like roots in the erotic roots in the sexual. So you have to learn to contain that to some extent. Um, and you want to express that in, in a way that is normal and sane, <laughs> like, you know, not going to cause discomfort to people. And definitely don't go into opposite sex spaces. Like, let female spaces be female spaces. And, you know, if you're going to express yourself in a gender non-confirming way, you know, just learn to go into the male spaces. Like, you know, if I was w going out like this in public, I would use, like, the male space. Like, there's no reason for me to go into the female space. And the more we normalize feminine males, the more we normalize gender non-conforming males, then the easier it will be for males to use male spaces and for females to keep the female space protected for females. That's just how it should, that's how it ought to be. So part of what, what I want to do is sort of normalize the idea that if you have AGP, you know, just learning to accept yourself, um, learning to express yourself and maintaining a male identity and, and not feeling like it's necessary to adopt this trans identity as a social container for your expression of, of yourself. We need to rehabilitate the concept that an autogynophile can be a normal person <laughs> and like express themselves in a feminine way. And we just need to get over the idea that transness is the answer to these desires because it's not, it leads to problems it leads to inauthenticity. Despite the trans narrative, it's like, oh, we're being authentic to ourselves. No, you are running away from your natural state of being. You are running away from your natural identity. You're running away from ontology, from the reality of who you are. And, you know, I, I think it's just healthy to learn to accept yourself, but you don't have to you know, limit your expression. You can be a male who's feminine. You can be a male who expresses yourself however you wish. Just, you know, but the whole social construction of this artificial identity, trying to pretend that, that you're a woman, trying to pretend that you're this like trans person, when in reality, just there's nothing wrong with just being a gender non-conforming male. There's nothing wrong with just accepting that you are a man who has a predilection for femininity. There's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't require this whole construction of this identity. Um, and so anyway, that, that's sort of my rant for, th for this video. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, I, I just wanna make, sp make space for uh, males to be feminine because that is what drove me to transition in the first place. That is what drove me to take on the medical pathway, which was ultimately destructive to my health and well-being. 
um, was this idea that I couldn't be a gender non-conforming male because there were no role models for that. I didn't know gender non-conforming males. That was not an acceptable thing to do. Um, and I will admit that I still struggle with a lot of like, you know, shame and, um, <laughs> you know, just like embarrassment in regards to, you know, expressing myself, you know, as a f f feminine male. It's like, you know, I, I think, but I, I'm trying to work. That is one of the things I'm working on is like getting over my shame. So I think shame is what drives people into transition. The hatred of masculinity, the hatred of maleness and femininity um, drives you into the trans identity because the trans identity is, the, is one of the only socially acceptable narratives for feminine males, particularly if you're not gay. If you're not homosexual, if you're just like, you know, attracted to women and you want to be feminine, it is very hard to do that in, in a way that is not sh like that doesn't induce shame. But the more we accept that males can be feminine, regardless of your sexual orientation, that you can just be a feminine man. And even admitting that that often has its roots in the erotic, because I think a lot because the femininity has its roots in the erotic. People want to jump into the trans identity and try and like destigmatize that through the trans identity. But we need to just acknowledge the reality of autogynophilia, acknowledge the reality that the healthy integration of autogynophilia and femininity can exist in a male per person. And you don't need to go down the me medical pathway. You don't need to transition. Um, and I don't want to generalize my experience and say like, oh, like, you know, no trans person can ever be happy, you know, going down the medical pathway, particularly if you're an adult and you're, you're mentally stable. But I just feel like it's not necessarily, you know, um, desirable to do that because it leads you to try and be something that you're not. It leads you to use female spaces. It leads you to sort of confuse language to confuse identities. And it sort of eliminates the idea that you can just be a feminine autogynophilic male who, you know, who doesn't try and take on this like constructed false identity of being a woman or being a trans woman, which you know, I think is running away from the reality of oneself as a man, as a male. So, and and sort of like uh, and, and it sort of like forces people to um, you know it like it like morally bludgeons people into believing these things about yourself because they're compelled to do that out of fear of being labeled as transphobic or something like this or they have a empathy trap such that you know they're compelled to see you in a certain way even if that violates you know the reality of your of your maleness violates the reality of being a man, but people are compelled to do that because they want to be polite because they want to be nice to you. And, you know, I think we're sort of like, uh, just like challenging reality. And I think it's just like healthier to just ground, ground your identity and what is real and what is empirical and what is, you know, a firmly based fact which is the fact that we are male, we are men, and you know we have autogynophilia. Just like accept it, learn to accept the truth. The truth will set you free, and that is one of the big lessons of my detransition: is grounding my identity in reality, in truth, and not trying to run away from that reality, and 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 like learning to accept that reality. Just accept who I am in my natural state of being, and like how I was brought into this world. To me, that has been healthy, that has been you know, liberating, you know, just accepting the reality that I am an autogynophilic male who likes to express myself in a feminine way, and that doesn't take away from my manhood, and that there's nothing wrong with being a man. There's nothing, you know, diseased about being a man. Testosterone is not a poison. Testosterone is not a disease. Being a man is not a bad thing. Being a feminine man is not a bad thing. And so, you know, I think we want to make space for that in our society. And the more we do that, the more we can get away from all this gender ideology nonsense that tries to confuse the meaning of words and tries to convince us that men can be women and males can be female. And, you know, it just like, and, and, and it encroaches on, you know, female spaces, on female rights, you know, sports and bathrooms and single sex spaces and, you know, 
I don't know. There, there's so much more to it. And I just think it's so much simpler and easier to just accept that, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a gender non-conforming man, even if you, you know, um, want to be really gender non-conforming. Um, so, okay. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.